It's time for the The Douglas Douglas Coleman Coleman Show. Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From From the the entertainment entertainment industry industry, to to authors to to political political and social social commentators, commentators, the famous and not so famous, the controversial and the light and fluffy, we have it all. Now, here's Douglas Douglas Coleman. Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Fidel Bowhill. Hi, Fidel, how are you? Hey, Douglas, I am tickety-boo, as we say over here in the UK. (laughs) Tickety-boo. All right. Where in the UK are you? Are you in London or near London? Uh, Nope, I'm in Bristol. Bristol. It's very very close to Wales, yeah, in the southwest of England. Oh, okay. All right. I've been to the UK, but I I don't... My geography of it is not that great. I guess for you guys, this would be a stone's throw from London. But... um, in England, it's quite a long way. 124 miles, to be precise. Oh, that's a commute for a lot of people here. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. So you've got a book out, and you call yourself a coach, a relationship coach. Is that your occupation? Yeah, do you know yeah. what? I own the title Life Coach. I know it rubs some people up the wrong way, but um, I generally help guys with their with their life. Like, the work they do with me helps them across their life. Um but mainly I focus on uh, relationships, yeah, and guys with midlife crisis. And you can make a living doing this. I make it. I make. I do all right. Douglas. Yeah, you do all right. Yeah. Oh, well, happy to hear I that. Do. Okay. <laughs> well, let's get into that a little bit. I'm just gonna read something here off your bio. It says, "Your work revolves around guiding men and some women through difficult times in their lives, particularly divorce or midlife crisis." by helping them to understand and love themselves. I had a terrible midlife crisis. Mine was, it was terrible in one sense, but it actually turned out (laughs) to be be fine, okay? (laughs) I usually do. And mine happened at 43 years old, and I I literally (laughs) quit everything. I quit my job, I sold my house, I moved across the country, uh, I got married, for the first time, and and it just like just changed everything. <laughs> just said, we're we're starting completely over, and uh, it was the best thing I ever did. I don't even think there is such a thing as a midlife crisis. I think it's actually it's mislabeled. I think it's a midlife awakening. Oh, I like that better. Oh, yes, an awakening. People just wake up and just go, "Geez, how the hell did I get here?" What am I doing? Why have I got all this stuff? What am I doing in this job? Why am I living in this house? Why am I living in this place? What am I doing married to them? Why aren't I married to them? Um, and and decide to make some changes. So how do you help somebody get through all of that? How do you help navigate them through that? Focus. Focus. So I have a little process that goes through values, vision, goals. I think lots of people midlife crisis is and and kind of like divorces they're kind of like pivotal moments in people's lives where they question everything um and so the world can just seem a bit confusing and they can be a bit directionless um unfortunately what that can often lead to is you know searching for the last time when they knew who they were which is in their youth and can lead to, to drugs and alcohol and going out clubbing and <laughs> uh right. playing all sorts of fun which is where the, the the idea of the red sports car comes from and so forth <laughs> but um like I, I have a little process that's fa- values vision goals we do it that way um because often what happens is people set goals but they're kind of random um and they, they're kind of fed by society all the people around them so i think people really need to know first of all their values so what what's actually important to them what means the most to them in their life um then we create a a 10 year vision, a clear and compelling vision of where they want to be. So they don't wake up in another 10 years going, how the hell did I get here? And then we choose our goals based, based on that. So we have some focus. We know what's important to us. Decision-making is easier for us um, because we know what's important and where we're going. And if it isn't in in line with our values and if it isn't taking us towards our, our vision, then it better be fun or we ain't doing it. I had a guest on a couple of days ago, and we got into this similar conversation. And she brought up the point about, wouldn't it be nice if we could all just write that letter to ourselves, 
meaning write the letter in your 50s and send it back to yourself when you were in your 20s. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it would just be so great. And when one is young, and I'll just use myself, myself as an example, for me, it was all about entertainment. That was the number one priority. I must be entertained yeah. at all times. <laughs> and I have to go out, I have to drink, I have to do whatever it is. I couldn't sit still for five minutes. I would be bored. And boredom to me was like, you know, the worst possible situation I could put myself into. Now, yeah. it's about comfort. And I can amuse myself with the most mundane tasks as long as I'm comfortable. And it's totally changed. The problem is when one is 20 years old, you have to sort of start preparing for that life of comfort. <laughs> and a lot of people don't. And it's not just about money, although money does help. But you've really yeah. got to know that, okay, in 30 years, I'm not going to give a damn about going out and clubbing and looking good and, you know, wearing the, the nicest clothes in the world. I'm going to be wanting comfort. Well, yeah. that depends on your values. Ah, but your values switch. My, I had a radical value switch People at my values midlife. Do switch, yeah, but, but always towards comfort and not always away from from having nice things or going out and enjoying themselves and having fun and adventure and stuff like that. I know quite a lot of clients where it's the total opposite. They've lived in comfort their whole lives and then they get to 40 and like, I haven't had any fun. I haven't been anywhere. Well, I haven't had any adventure. What have I achieved? Um, I want to go and do do some stuff. So some people have, uh, sort of switch it around, actually. If okay. you, a lot of people yeah. go to university yeah. and then they go straight into the rat race, straight into a job, and they go straight onto the treadmill, marry, have kids at a young age and everything else like that, and then they get to their mid-40s. And they're like, what? What happened here? Yeah, I did it the other way around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I completely did it the other way around. But that's okay. Yeah, I, I can see that that happening with people. Um, do you think so, people well, get I, married too young? these days I, I i struggle to see how th this model of marriage fits into our society these days i'm not i'm not sure that it does um i anymore. would agree I mean, it was just the concept yeah. of marriage and, and sort of lifetime monogamy was was only invented a few hundred years ago and it was invented for kind of safety security and financial purposes for both sides um and i'm not sure that it fits now that we're all living until we're 90. Um, i mean you got married how, how, when did you get married i was 43. yeah you see um so interesting and you'd already had a load of fun and everything else like that so marriage at 43 is kind of seems a bit better especially if your values are all around sort of just being comfortable and settled and and everything else like that so I'm sure people marry when they're too young but i think there's too much emphasis on sort of divorce or separating afterwards being being such a terrible terrible thing um i know over in the states there's a big you know there's quite a big religious um drive over there and it's like so from a religion religious point of view um i, I kind of get it but from an anthropological perspective, I'm not sure that it really fits anymore. I don't really think it does. And to go back to something you were saying, you know, all the laws and everything that were created and at what point people got married, like you said, was only created in the last couple hundred years. It was primarily to protect the women and children because mm. the men would just <laughs> bang, bang, bye, bye. And they wanted to make sure that uh, children and women were protected. But these days, because women didn't work in those days. I think it's, I think it's actually the other way around. So Do you I, think so? I think what happened with, yeah, with the Industrial Revolution and capitalism and everything else like that, we had to figure out a way of getting men to work and earn more than they needed. Otherwise, capitalism doesn't work. I'm not an anti-capitalist, by the way. Um, I play the game as much as the next man. But you know it's kind of based on greed right it's kind of based on people wanting more than they actually need because otherwise it just wouldn't work because we'd all just be sat around happy in a in a field somewhere you know and so the only real way to get a man to go to work um, and earn more than he needs is to say well it goes somewhere after you die um i know we'll have inheritance it's really important that you work really hard in order to provide for your offspring and then when you die they don't have to work although 
will still get them to do it. Now, the only way you're going to do that is if you can ensure that those children are actually yours. <laughs> Uh, well, okay, yeah, I've never heard this concept, but it's interesting. Okay, yeah. yeah, it's a big one. I mean, the only way to ensure that the children are yours is if you kind of possess the the woman who's going to bear them for you. Um, and so that's really where marriage first first came. And so w women were owned effectively. That's what marriage was when it first came along. They were yes, that's true. Yeah. but kind of, they were they were given away. Everything was arranged. You were you were given by your parents. Sometimes you had to uh, pay for them and and so forth. Give their parents some money. Um, That's still they, done in some countries. Exactly, it still yeah. is. Um, and then, after a few hundred years of that, women were like, "Oi, oi, we don't, we don't want to. This isn't good for us anymore. You know, we're just going to carry on doing our own thing." And so, then, I think the earliest mention of it is about 380 to 400 years ago. This, the concept of romance was introduced, and so we, like, got women to choose and think that getting married was a romantic thing for them to do and it was really important for them to so in, we managed to get them to buy into the whole concept of kind of being owned themselves and 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 having a lifetime of, of monogamy and no cheating and everything else like that not look, not looking at anybody else so so we'd all still go and then they then we got them working as well so now everybody's working <laughs> everybody's paying taxes everybody wants more than they need um and the whole system works Again, I'm not knocking it, but it is what it is. But this is this goes back to the point, and we can fast forward to probably the late 1960s, early 1970s, when mm -hmm. women really did start to work as well as men. Yeah. Getting married young may not necessarily be the best solution or the best idea for people. My grandparents well, no. were 18 and 16 when they got married. In the, wow. in the 1920s, okay? Now, my grandmother never worked at a payroll-type job in her life. She stayed home, she cooked, she cleaned, she took care of the children. That was her function. Grandfather provided the money. He worked, right? That's what it was for most of the uh, 20th century. Now, yeah. I know uh, as many couples now, the woman makes far more than the man, and I know several couples where the man stays home and takes care of the kids. He's a musician, works out perfectly. She has the corporate job. She goes to work every day. He stays home, Is gets the kids off to school, and then goes and piddles in his studio for <laughs> a few hours a day. People, though, that brings around its own problems, which is kind of like my pet subject about masculine and feminine energies. But um, on the whole, I think generally people don't get married at that age anymore. They are leaving it later and later. The, the, the issue that we've got is still that there's this thing that you should get married and then have kids. And so obviously women's biological clocks well, yes. start to yeah. And, and they want to have a child within a stable relationship, right? So they have to find a guy, you know, so the, the hunt starts um, sort of mid-20s. Um, and then there's all this stigma around women who are single in their mid-30s. When are you going to get married? When are you going to find somebody? Clock's ticking. You're going to give us babies um, and all that sort of stuff. So there's still a lot of, sort of social kind of pressure around all of this, um, which isn't particularly natural for our species to be honest with you but um yeah i think i think it's happening later and later it depends why you're marrying so lots of people and the reason why my book has taken off so well and the work that i do is that people get married have the children and then they can be great partners for that part of their life including myself so this was this is what happened to me i'm still great friends with my ex-wife we were absolutely we spent 15 happy years together um we were absolutely we're perfect parents we're total opposites so we brought a nice balance for our children uh, we were very dedicated to each other and and the kids but once the kids had got a bit older my youngest is 14 now we, we divorced uh two years now that we just kind of looked at each other and we're like, well, now we've got all this time with each other. I'm not sure, like, now we've got this midlife crisis part or mid midlife awakening. I want to go over here and do all this stuff. And she was like, mm, I kind of want to go over there and do all that stuff. Um, and we were just totally heading off in different directions. Um, and neither of us, if you can either compromise or that leaves both of you fa fairly unhappy or one of you can just agree and nod and then one person will be really ha unhappy. Um and so actually, I think the the idea that we base a success on a relationship on its longevity, I think is a bit misguided. 
I think actually our relationship was perfect because what a great relationship is is knowing knowing when it's over and being able to 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 end it in a really nice and amicable way. Well, I would agree with you. There's nothing worse than a nasty divorce. Certainly nobody wants to go through that. Lots of them are, unfortunately. Yeah, lots of them are. Uh, I know I agree with your point. And it's an interesting point that, uh, you know, perhaps we should not judge the quality of a relationship based on its longevity. I think that's an interesting point. I've had some amazing <clears throat> relationships that have just been like 48 hours. <laughs> I've had some that have been 15 minutes, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think as long as you, you you kind of you're open and communicative both beforehand and afterwards um, with it, you can still remain remain friendly or you know not leave with any bad blood, and everybody kind of walks away with a smile on their face. I think is great, and I think nowadays young people, certainly over here in the UK sort of under 30s now are looking at all kinds of different relationship setups and, and different lifestyles and the way they're going to do things. The one thing that you did bring up, which which does have to be factored in, is you have to decide whether you want to have children or not. See, I don't have yeah. children. And at this point, I, I won't because it's just too far down the road. And I got married at 43. And at that point, I said, nah, no chance for children now. I mean, obviously I could, but yeah, you can. Guys, guys can. Yeah, well, guys can. Uh, what was it? Keith Richards had one at seventy-eight or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you you make the decision that you're not going to have them, you know, because I don't want to be in my sixties when my kid is going to college, you know. Yep. Uh, I just don't want it. So that worked out fine. But it's different for everybody. People that do want to have children should probably have them in their 20s to 30s, I would say. Women, Particularly women the clock woman clock. and the biological clock and yeah. all of that. That's a reality. A absolutely. Yeah. Women, women do need to, to have it, obviously, before before menopause. Right. Um, so there is actually a time scale for them. There is a point where they can't, um, which, which makes it slightly different to, to, to men. Um, and obviously go, going through all of that is better done when they're, young and fit and strong um etc and again if you want to have more than one so you're listening to mr smooth and savvy right here on the douglas coleman show we'll be right back after these commercial messages djc music and djc productions are pleased to announce a brand new website we have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests this is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments, or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of the Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. I, I want to hit on one of your questions. It says, why is it so important to embrace both masculine and feminine energies? We kind of have this attachment to the masculine and feminine. We have this attachment to the roles. So who goes to work, who stays at home. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. It sounds like you've got a couple of friends there that, that may that may not do that so if you've got if you're a rock rock musician or, or whatever um i'm sure he's still the man like i'm sure he's very um very in his masculine energy but he he performs all the what are traditionally feminine 
tax. Um, now, I don't think those two things are linked particularly, but I think that's the way we see it, and that's the bit that causes confusion um, and can also cause problems when you're saying that the, yeah, when women earn a lot more than their partners. I think a lot of men feel very emasculated by that. You know, I'm certainly for women's rights. I think women should be allowed to do anything they want to do, work in any capacity they want to work. Yeah. Um, however, with this sort of climate of toxic masculinity that has been perpetrated and toxic femininity, I'm going to use both sides. Yeah. It, it makes people resentful or resistant, might be a better word, to taking on traditional roles. I have seen people get blasted on social media for simply saying, for women, for simply saying that they want to stay home and take care of their children. I think those people that do the blasting, I believe they're very, very, very much in the minority. But I think they're the noisy minority. I would, yeah, yeah, I would think so. I think they're the ones that make the most noise. So it doesn't necessarily, I think a lot of us, especially men, I mean, I, I've got a big Facebook community full of guys. I remember when I first opened it up, they were all like, what are we going to do if the women find us in here? Men aren't allowed their own spaces. And I was like, you're kidding me. <laughs> really can't wait for us to go over here and sort our shit out. Excuse my language. Um, and I get loads of support. I'm nothing but supported by women for men, men becoming in touch with their positive masculinity, with men being men uh, without the toxic part, which is, a, again, I think it's an overused phrase. I, I think it's not overused. It does. I, I do believe it does exist. I do believe there's an issue and I do. I believe there's a there's sort of reasons behind that. Um, but I think actually on the whole, most most people know that, that the majority of men are good guys you know, and the majority of women aren't um, really kind of angry at them all and, and everything else like that and don't want them to be men anymore. I would hope so. I would hope so. But like I said, those are the ones you see, the noisy ones. You the know? noisy ones. And I, I just think this thing is kind of perpetuated, but I don't think it's real. Um, that's been my experience. Don't get me wrong. It's sort of three years ago, I thought it was real. But um, it's only through my work where I've realized, actually, it's, you know, you get guys going, well, you know, I held into the door once and a woman told me like that I shouldn't open the door for it. So I kind of, I've stopped opening doors now. I'm like, dude, like, why would you let one person being upset with you who could have been having a bad day or, or whatever, like if that was truly one of your values, you'd carry on holding doors open. Like it's not a thing. Like if 99 out of 100 women uh, really appreciate you holding a door open, but you stop because one woman had a go at you and you don't even know why or what her reasons were behind it or she said something to you, then that's not very masculine for a start. And yeah. I think that those stories are the ones that get perpetuated and it makes us feel like there's this big drive that's kind of anti-masculinity and anti-men and I'm not sure that it's actually really there, but we perpetuate it ourselves. Men do it as much as women. I actually had a situation similar to that at a restaurant once. I should name the restaurant, too, just to <laughs> be spiteful, but I, but I won't. But it was in Malibu, California, of all places. And you know how when two people who are not together are walking towards a doorway at the same time, right, yeah. to go into the restaurant? And I was walking in, and this woman was walking in, and I just backed off two steps to allow her to go through the door first, right? Good. And she gave me the nastiest look and said, you think I need you to stop because I'm a woman? That's what she said yeah. to me. Right? <laughs> I wasn't in a great mood that day, and I let her have it. I mean, I just yeah. let her have it with the C word flying, and oh, I thought I was oh, wow. going to get kicked out of that restaurant. But uh, anyways, they were nice enough to seat us at opposite ends of the restaurant, and it all worked out okay. <laughs> But has that stopped you doing the same thing? Honestly, it's never come up again. You know, maybe I maybe I would uh, you know be twenty paces behind any woman going into a restaurant now. I don't know if it is. It's subconscious, you know. But it certainly lingered with me for a long time. Just that attitude. There you go, brother. Yeah. Because again, you know, a we don't know what 
experiences she's actually had with men in her in her lifetime now unfortunately there are quite a lot of men out there doing a lot of bad things to women um that that it does happen and it's really really common for for women to have experienced you know if you think that that one incident for you and how it's kind of embedded itself into your psyche imagine being a woman and being groped when you were 15 or something by a man imagine how therefore how much that incident will have, will kind of affect you in your attitudes towards men and that's just kind of at the minor end i also run a women's group and i when again when i started having these conversations and, and sort of stepped out as somebody as a, as a representative for men i also had to spend a lot of time listening to women and it's absolutely frightening the the volume of which women have been i'll say sexually abused to some degree and how many times throughout their life and so you know the we, we don't know what women have been through and how that affects their kind of their 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 view of men and again you don't know what she was she might have just been in a bad day and just thought uh she's expecting you to look at her bum or something like that as she well, walked through the door that might have been before. yes i i agree with everything you say and and certainly women have been through a lot many women have many women haven't the problem yeah. is and this is a bigger cultural problem it's not just her yeah. but it's something that's called misdirected anger and yes when people like that start misdirecting their anger at an individual like me or men as a whole, or they pick a particular ethnic group to blame all of their troubles on, then I yeah. take issue with that because it's wrong. It is. It is wrong. Yeah. Um, sometimes understandable, but still wrong. Um, and then I think, but the only way to kind of combat that isn't to kind of hide away from it, which is, where guys doing the work doing work like like i do come into it where we put ourselves forward and we represent men and represent healthy healthy masculinity we demonstrate it we talk about it we discuss it and we help other guys learn how to how to express it and and, and do it as well so i think that, and there's a rise in that now um, I think there's more and more coaches out there and, and people talking about masculinity and talking about men in positive ways um, and I think, yeah, we, we 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 had a bit of a blip, didn't we? And I think I think we're coming out of it. I've got one more question for you, and then we do have to wrap this up. I mentioned my grandparents, who were married in the 1920s, and you know, as teenagers. Yeah. Uh, actually, this is a two-part question. Number one, you said you had children. Uh, is one of your children a, a girl or a boy? I guess it doesn't really matter. Well, I've got three daughters. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> well, imagine yourself as you, as the father having yeah. your 16-year-old daughter say, Daddy, I'm getting married. What would you yeah, say? No. no. Yeah. You'd be right out of <laughs> yeah. your mind, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, these days, I mean, it's unheard of, right? But yeah, it is. at the time, it was celebrated. And they thought, oh, For good, sure. she's getting married before it's too late. That was the family's attitude. She was going to be yeah, a spinster by the time she was 18. People did it back then because it was the only way you were supposed to be able to have sex. Well, that's true. Yeah, that's just true. So they, 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 they pretend it was all to do with these other things, but really they just wanted to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is a horrible thought for me to think about considering as my grandmother but um yeah your point is well taken and they lived happily ever after for you know 60 yeah. plus years and died a year apart so different expectations as well though you know now we're at this, this kind of freedom and expression and uh, spending money on all this kind of stuff and, and this massive drive that we've all got to search for our happiness and um, and all this sort of stuff. I think in that generation just had much kind of simpler expectations of life. I mean, they were they were, they were you now, but at that age, you know, they just were like, oh, we just want, kind of want to survive. We want to be comfortable uh, because even then, back in the nineteen twenties, times were tough, you know. Yeah. And so you had to kind yeah, of like pair up and and. And, and knuckle down, you know, just to survive. 
and so your kind of the teamwork was there yeah our generation i mean we've we've not listen as tough times as i've grown up i haven't grown up in the silver spoon in my mouth not by a very long stretch but generally you know we've got things pretty cushy you know so this was a two-part question so the first part was you know could you imagine your 16 year old daughter getting married and we know the answer to that so the second part of this question was in those days the male and female roles were very black and white yes. you know she didn't think oh i'm going to be a doctor no no you're going to be a housewife and you're going to stay home and raise the kids and then papa is going to work do you think that was easier because now there's so many choices for men and women that yes. I think we're all running around a little bit like chickens with our heads cut off. Where back then it was like, okay, you got married, you're going to do this, I'm going to do that, end of story. Yes. So I think it's simpler, not necessarily easier. I think when you speak to a lot of people of that generation, they, they struggled with that a lot, both both parties, both men and women. Um, thirdly, you hit on a really interesting point. I'll, I'll try not to labor it too much, but choice actually doesn't make us happier more choice doesn't make us happier well, i think one of the one of the worst things we say to children nowadays is you can be whatever you want to be it sounds very liberating and very free but um from a psychological point of view human beings are kind of designed to feel fomo the fear of missing out and so when we pick one thing what we really think of is the 99 million other things that we're not going to be or get to do mm. and so with all this choice and, and options we think freedom is happiness but actually for the human brain it doesn't quite work like that we actually you know we actually quite like when we feel quite comfortable when when we have a sort of a certain amount a certain pathway and everything else like that um and so it's easy it's easier I, I think a lot of people still struggled with it but they again they had simpler expectations and they had survival in mind you know yeah, I still I'm haven't. Uh, I haven't quite so, decided for myself if it's uh, too much choice. I think just makes people nuts. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So too much choice, people unhappy for sure, and it's definitely responsible for a lot of confusion and a lot of the problems we have within marriage. So, but here's the thing: we don't want to go back then. What we have to do is find a new way, a ba a new balanced way, because I don't think we want to just go back to that men going to work and women staying at home i don't think I, I just i think that model's dead as well what we have to do is is look for a a newer a newer way iceland is a bit if, if for any of your listeners and yourself um have a little look at the way that iceland do things uh, they have they're the happiest country in the world they have the smallest gender gap um in terms of wages and jobs half their parliament are, are women um they have the most children born to unwed mothers, 67% um, of children are born to unwed mothers, and they have the highest divorce rate, yet they're the happiest nation in the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> interesting not, statistics, uh, yeah. There's some really interesting, I, I got lost down a rabbit hole learning, I, I, I was planning to go over there, but obviously the way the world is at the moment, I can't, but when I need to go over and investigate myself because I find it fascinating. The final statistic is that even though they have all of this equality, you've got this massive split where women are still, like something like 80% of the women are still employed in two industries, which is uh, education and social services and the health service. Mm. So almost traditionally feminine kind of industries. Right. Which is really interesting, given that they've got all of the choice and everything else like that around them and, and it's all very supportive and they can have the highest rate of working women in the world. And yet they still naturally veer towards those kind of job roles. Interesting. I guess the other statistics that I'd like to see from Iceland is their uh, drug and alcohol addiction rates. I think they're pretty low. Are they low? Yeah. 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 Because I know in other places, I'm comparing them to Scandinavia, I guess. Uh, well, yeah, because Iceland is a what was the Danish, right? It's still controlled by Al Al it's really, really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's why. Uh, Fidel, we got to wrap this up. Thank you so much for coming on. My guest is Thank Fidel you. Bohill, and your book is called what? Divorce: A Modern Man's Guide. Okay, and uh, give out a website that people can come check you out. My website is modernman.org.uk. Um, I have a Facebook group called the Modern Man Club, 
um, and another one called the Modern Woman Club. If that's the best way to find me is on on Facebook. Uh, yeah, those are quite fun places to come and hang out. Okay, great. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I know we could have gone on for another three days or so. Best of luck with everything you're doing. Nice meeting you. Cheers.